Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, especially on this astonishingly beautiful spring evening. It's great that people tore themselves away from the meadows and beach and came up to the campus. We're glad to have you here. Um, I'm Paul Hall, president of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation, and I'm both proud and grateful to be a graduate of UC Santa Cruz uh, and of the law school at Berkeley. This is the inaugural lecture in the UC Hastings Social Justice Speakers Series given by faculty of the UC Hastings Law School in San Francisco. As you will shortly hear, as part of an innovative partnership with UC Santa Cruz. Hastings College of the Law was founded in 1878. It was the first law school in California and then the first law school in the University of California system. Uh, tonight, we're hearing a very important talk by Professor Morris Ratner of UC Hastings, who before he became a professor, was a very accomplished litigation attorney and partner in a major plaintiff's class action law firm. And he then took those considerable lawyering skills and had the uh, leap of imagination and innovation and downright gumption to set that aside and undertake the groundbreaking litigation that you're going to hear about tonight to further the cause of restitution of property and compensation for Holocaust survivors and their descendants. Uh, this is the first lecture in this series. Uh, next fall, our second lecture will be by UC Hastings Academic Dean Beth Hillman on the topic of sexual assault in the military. Um, as you know, that's a very timely topic. It's been much debated. Uh, there have been two major bills in Congress, competing visions offered by the senators from New York and Missouri uh, concerning the best way to tackle the problem. Um, and we very much look forward to Dean Hillman's talk in the fall. One important talk that is not part of this legal lecture series, but which I would very much uh, invite people to come to, will be held here on April 25, Friday, April 25. Um, it is at the beginning of the alumni weekend, but this is an event open to all, uh, to everybody. Uh, it's called Launch, and it celebrates the student experience at UC Santa Cruz. And very importantly, the keynote speaker on Friday, April 25, will be former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Uh, Leon Panetta is a great public servant. He served 20 plus years as a member of Congress, was chair of the House Budget Committee, became President Clinton's chief of staff, later was director of the CIA, and then served with great distinction as Secretary of Defense. Um, so if, if you are free the evening of Friday, April 25, I would very much urge you to come right back here uh, and listen to Secretary Panetta talk. Um, this lecture this evening, and by the way, that lecture is described in the green brochure uh, that was uh, available at the uh, tables incoming. Uh, this lecture is part of the UCSC and UC Hastings 3 plus 3 program. That is a very innovative partnership between this university and the Hastings Law School, which offers an accelerated academic program to allow students to earn both their BA and the JD law degree in a total of six years rather than seven. Again, uh, speaking to the national debate, you've doubtless read many articles in the last few years about the ever escalating cost of undergraduate and professional school, the way many students are graduating with crushing debt loads, and the way a lot of people feel that they're being priced out of undergraduate and professional schools. Um, the accelerated program is meant for students who are vigorous, determined, know what they want to do, and have the drive to get through college and law school in six years. Uh, it gives them a, 
a help with crediting the first year of law school credits toward their undergraduate degree. So they're three years here and three years at UC Hastings. It's an innovative program that was just approved all the way up the chain of command at the University of California and it will get its first applications this fall. Uh, so many of you here may be attorneys and if the program sounds good to you, you can help. You can help with internships, mentorships, and scholarships. And if you like the ship metaphor, think of yourself as getting on board a ship that will help these students navigate to achieve their dreams. The UC Santa Cruz and Hastings Law School partnership really is a case of one plus one equals a lot more than two. Um, together they can do more than they can do separately. Uh, they both though have very common values. UC Santa Cruz is known for and dedicated to what we call the transformational student experience, which we try to further with the college system and through our firm commitment to innovative, thinking out of the box, interdisciplinary work. UC Hastings uh, similarly is devoted to social justice, to lawyering for and with underrepresented members of our society, and it is also a leader in another national debate about how to better educate lawyers through giving them practical courses uh, in the latter parts of law school so that they get um, under the auspices of the school uh, real lawyer training just as doctors get in inter internships. Uh, that's again a big national debate where Hastings is in the lead in, uh, in bringing forth solutions. Switching gears now to the subject of this evening, tonight's lecture and Professor Ratner's work is one, one response to trying to address the unspeakable tragedy of the Holocaust. Here at UC Santa Cruz, we have done what we can academically to address the same problem. Uh, for many years now, we have uh, had a program directly on that subject that was funded by the Ann Neufeld Levin Endowment. Um, Ann was my colleague on the UC Santa Cruz Foundation where she served as president um, and then she gave uh, generously um, to support a chair uh, in that subject. It takes a lot of people to launch a new program such as the one that we're describing this evening. Um, I want to thank all of them uh, and a few in particular. First, as I just mentioned, the Neufeld Levin Holocaust Chair Endowment, the UC Hastings College of the Law, the UC Santa Cruz Politics Department, the Legal Studies Program, the Division of Social Sciences, and the Institute for Humanities Research. And those deans are here this evening. I also want to thank the Santa Cruz County Bar Association, the Santa Cruz Women Lawyers Association, Temple Beth L, the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County, and Santa Cruz Hillel. And before I get to Professor Kelly Weisberg, I've been instructed to make one public service announcement of great concern to lawyers. Uh, this lecture this evening is eligible for MCLE credit, so uh, if you're a lawyer and if you didn't already sign up for your MCLE credit, it's over in that corner after, after the talk is done. As we move to this evening's uh, main event, I want to say thanks in particular to UC Hastings professor Kelly Weisberg. Uh, she is a leading national scholar and casebook author in the fields of family law and domestic violence. She is also a very broad gauge thinker, an innovator, and a tireless worker who makes things happen. She is really the moving force behind the UCSC and UC Hastings 3 plus 3 program behind the speaker series and I really want to thank you Kelly.
One last ministerial annou announcement. Um, Professor Ratner will allow time for questions. And many people received index cards as they entered, and a few more index cards have been passed out by ushers. Um, 10 or 15 minutes before the end of the talk, ushers will be collecting cards, uh, and we'll try to sift through and ask, you know, get as many questions asked and answered as we can. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Kelly Weisberg, who will introduce Professor Ratner. Kelly. Welcome, everyone. It's an honor to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. I'm proud to call Morris Ratner a colleague, and I'm delighted to share with you the insider's perspective about this very accomplished man. The title of tonight's talk, as you know, is a monument man in the courtroom litigating the Holocaust. Yet I have to tell you, that Morris Ratner is so modest that he took great pains to tell me, not just once, but several times, that he really isn't a monument man. Those who recovered art stolen by the Nazis during World War II. But let me suggest an alternative name for Morris. He is certainly a monumental man, a man whose work has lasting impact. Now, I suspect that some might prefer a different moniker for Morris, that of a mensch. A mensch is a Yiddish term for someone of honor and integrity, someone who is deeply admired by others. Let me tell you a little story that illustrates just how Morris is regarded by others. It's a story I've never told Morris. One day, as I was walking down the corridor at Hastings on my way to get a cup of coffee at the faculty lounge, I quickly turned a corner and I came to a dead stop. There were students sitting everywhere, everywhere I looked. I couldn't move. So I stood there in my morning pre-caffeine fog trying to take it in. I said to myself, something important is happening here. What is it? And I look around and I say to myself, I know what it is. This is familiar. The students are having a sit-in. Then I think to myself, wait a minute here. But why are they sitting in at the faculty coffee lounge and not at the other end of the hall where the dean's office is? What are they protesting? They don't want the faculty to drink coffee? And suddenly, it dawned on me what they were doing there. They weren't staging a sit-in. Morris Ratner's office was right there adjacent to the faculty coffee lounge. They were waiting to see Morris because Morris is so popular that the students literally line up waiting to see him. As you can see, Morris's students just adore him and so do we. Morris is here tonight to talk about his successful prosecution of Holocaust-era legal claims against European companies and governments that profited from Nazi atrocities. Because of him, victims of Nazi persecution have received more than $8 billion, that's billion dollars, in reparations. This is a story of audacious thinking, because who would ever have imagined taking legal action in American courts against European companies and governments so many decades after the Holocaust. This is also a story of persistence and ultimately a story of triumph. Morris's success inspired him to become a teacher because he experienced firsthand the power of the law to effectuate change. And he wanted to inspire his students to do the same thing, to use the law as a source of social good. 
Professor Ratner grew up in the San Jose area. He attended Stanford University and then Harvard Law School, where he taught for two years. For many years, he was a litigator in a San Francisco law firm, Leaf Cabraser, Hyman and Bernstein, where he specialized in complex litigation, focusing on class action suits. His work emphasized not only human rights, but also consumer protection and environmental protection. As I'm sure you'll agree, this man is a mensch. He is the perfect speaker to kick off this inaugural event in our UC Hastings Social Justice Speaker Series. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Morris Ratner. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for that very warm and generous introduction. And uh, I also want to extend a special thank you to Kelly. I've known for a while that she's a wonderful colleague and a, and a tremendously talented scholar, but I've also had the chance over the past few months to see her in action as an organizer of events and programs, and she is a formidable organizer, so thank you very much. Uh, I am humbled and honored to be the inaugural speaker at this uh, in this Social Justice Speaker Series, and to have the chance to speak with you tonight about a subject Subject so uh, close to my heart and close to home, social justice litigation in general and uh, Holocaust litigation in particular. If I accomplish nothing else tonight, at least I hope, I will honor the memory of the Holocaust victims on whose behalf we litigated the Holocaust era claims that I'll be describing to you tonight. Uh, in that spirit, I'm going to start by uh, introducing you to one family uh, whose story I came to know, uh, along with thousands of other similar stories in the course of the litigation that we pursued. Uh, Manfred and Lena Froelich uh, lived in Mainz, Germany, uh, and uh, Manfred worked there as a merchant and owned a store before the Holocaust. Uh, during the Holocaust, they were persecuted because they were Jewish. Uh, Manfred died in 1942. We do not know from the file how he died, uh, but we know that he was uh, in Nazi Germany in 1942 and the circumstances could not have been pleasant. Lena Froelich was deported to the Piaski concentration camp in Lublin, Poland, where she is presumed to have perished. Uh, their son, Hermann Jacob Froelich was born in 1912 and died in 1966, and their daughter, Alice, who was born in 1920 and died in 1991, both of their children, Hermann and Alice, managed to escape Nazi Germany and emigrated to the United States. Uh, so of special relevance to the litigation I pursued, Hermann Froelich, uh, Manfred and Lena's son, on May 14, 1948, wrote a letter to a Swiss bank just after the war, inquiring whether the bank had any information regarding a bank account or a safe deposit box that may have been uh, opened in the name of one of his parents. Uh, and at the time he wrote the letter, uh, he provided a death certificate for his father, Manfred, and notified the bank that he would be unable to provide a death certificate for his mother, Lena, as she had perished in a concentration camp. Uh, the bank wrote back within two weeks on May 26, 1948, and uh, wrote to uh, Hermann Froelich. They didn't normally respond to inquiries absent conclusive proof that the person inquiring is the legitimate heir of someone who had died, but that in this one instance they would make an exception to inform Hermann Froelich that the persons he had named, Manfred and Lena Froelich, had, quote, no connection to the bank and possessed no assets at the bank, close quote. This is a fairly typical account of an interaction between a Swiss bank after the Holocaust and the heir of a Holocaust victim. The banks regularly required, as a condition of providing any information regarding an account, even the information that the account did not exist, 
death certificates, uh, proof uh, that the person inquiring was an heir, usually estate documents, and in addition, imposed search charges uh, on a per bank, per search basis that sometimes amounted to up to several hundred Swiss francs. Uh, the Swiss franc is trading currently at uh, 0.89 Swiss francs to the dollar, so it gives you a sense of the uh, cost of the search. Uh, these and other Swiss bank policies were part of a program of bank secrecy that was designed to protect the anonymity and the uh, confidences of the account holders. And uh, that secrecy was attractive to Jews and other targets of Nazi persecution prior to and during the war for obvious reasons. After the war, after the Holocaust, uh, bank secrecy policies operated to hide the existence of dormant accounts and other assets in Swiss banks from the rightful heirs uh, to whom those assets should have been distributed. Heirs of Holocaust uh, victims had a very difficult time obtaining death certificates, as you can imagine, and uh, most of those heirs did not have access to estate documents. The typical heir of a Holocaust victim was, say, a child uh, during the Holocaust who had managed to escape, who uh, did, was not usually privy to that kind of information, uh, or was a distant relative uh, who uh, knew that family members had died and were just making inquiries to see if there were assets in any of the Swiss banks that were so attractive to targets of Nazi persecution. And because the heirs did not necessarily know which bank had the assets, the search charges were particularly onerous. Uh, as of the close of the war in the mid-1940s, there were literally hundreds of Swiss banks uh, in which foreign nationals uh, who feared Nazi persecution made deposits on a regular basis. By the time we sued the Swiss banks, most of those banks had consolidated into just three banks, but as of the time Herman Froelich was making his inquiry, if he were being charged a fee on a per bank basis, he would have to make that uh, uh, expense on a repeat basis hundreds of times to do a comprehensive search. The Swiss banks could have adopted a very different approach to dealing with the possibility of dormant accounts uh, still in the bank after the Holocaust. They could have done a thorough and independent audit identified the names of probable or possible uh, Holocaust victims who had accounts or other assets with the banks, published those names so that uh, heirs or relatives could identify the accounts and make claims, and operated a claims program based on the evidence and uh, documentation that was available in the bank files as of the end of the war. Uh, they did not uh, do that. Uh, they considered it a violation of bank secrecy uh, commitments to publish account holder names. So what they did instead was they conducted uh, a, a not very rigorous uh, voluntary audit after the war, which immediately after the war revealed about a million Swiss francs in potential dormant account assets. Uh, and then subsequent to that, facing international pressure, conducted additional voluntary audits in 1956, in 1962, and again in 1995, just before we filed our litigation. In total, in the aggregate, all of those audits combined revealed about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 dormant accounts valued at a few tens of millions of dollars. Uh, it's important to recognize when thinking about the voluntary audits that the banks conducted that they had financial incentives to underreport the existence of dormant accounts and financial disincentives to report the existence of either dormant accounts or accounts that were closed under suspicious circumstances during the Holocaust. Uh, the financial incentives become clear when we realize three facts. First, uh, unlike other countries, uh, Switzerland did not have a law of a sheet. So dormant accounts stayed indefinitely with the banks. Uh, in addition, the banks were free to assess, and did, assess uh, processing fees and other charges on dormant accounts. So after the war, a Holocaust victim could have an account with a Swiss bank that had a positive balance. The banks uh, could hang on to that account indefinitely and assess charges against it, which could and often did reduce the value of that account to a zero balance. Uh, and in addition, one more fact uh, that uh, produced the incentive to underreport and self-audits, the banks only had to hold on to account records under Swiss law for 10 years. They weren't required to destroy records after 
10 years, but they were allowed to destroy records of bank accounts and other uh, bank assets after 10 years. And with that permission under Swiss law, the banks aggressively and systematically destroyed account information uh, 10 years after any account was deemed dormant. So that meant the banks could, uh, through uh, barriers to uh, finding accounts uh, uh, that were erected uh, in, in, in connection with bank secrecy laws, hold on to accounts, charge them down to a zero balance, and then erase all records of what the banks did because they were allowed to destroy documents relating to dormant accounts. The banks also had a financial disincentive to uncover and expose accounts uh, that were uh, closed under suspicious circumstances, and here's why. Uh, during the Holocaust, as Nazi Germany uh, occupied new countries, uh, they engaged in a systematic process of Aryanizing and obtaining Jewish assets. So the banks were confronted with requests from the Reich Bank, not from account holders, but from the German Reich Bank, to uh, transfer funds, in particular uh, bank accounts, from the Swiss banks uh, to the Reich Bank. And they conducted research at that time to determine if they were allowed to do so, and their own research confirmed that transferring account balances uh, where the circumstances indicated that the account holder was making the request under duress would be a breach of the bank's fiduciary duties to account holders under Swiss law. They nevertheless decided to engage regularly in account transfers, uh, sometimes earning fees on the transfers, and always with the hope of maintaining good relations with Nazi Germany. I am assuming the calculus was that the potential liability associated with breach of fiduciary duty claims from victims of Nazi persecution were outweighed by the benefits of maintaining good relations with Nazi Germany. Uh, so it is possible that the Froelich family's uh, interactions with, oh, I should tell you one more thing. Uh, after getting the May 26th letter from the bank, Herman Froelich took no further action, right? He, he had no reason to take any further action. He had no reason to disbelieve the Swiss bank that told him that it had no connection to his parents. And he did what any other rational person would do. He went on with his life. Uh, so that story would have ended there, but for the fact that in the mid-1990s, we sued the Swiss banks. Uh, we reached a $1.25 billion settlement with the banks, and in connection with that settlement, we had a claims program, uh, and in that claims program uncovered uh, uh, much information that would have remained invisible but for the litigation. I should say we also sued private corporations from uh, Germany, uh, primarily associated with uh, slave and forced labor claims against German manufacturers, as well as uh, claims against private corporations from Austria and French banks. And we settled each uh, such category of litigation on a country by country basis. Uh, the total uh, uh, amount of all the settlements combined was close to $8 billion. Because I only have an hour with you this evening uh, for the lecture portion of my presentation, I can't cover all of those litigations and settlements. Uh, but I've left a suggested reading list uh, on the side over here if you're interested and uh, identified some documents that provide that kind of information. And if there's interest during the Q&A, I can provide more information. I'm going to focus on the Swiss bank litigation I've just described, and in particular on the dormant account claims in that litigation, and on the Froelich family claim as a vehicle for asking asking three questions. First, uh, why did we file these cases 50 years after the Holocaust, and how were they resolved? Second, did the litigation and the settlement uh, provide meaningful justice to Holocaust victims? Or put differently, is litigation an appropriate response to the Holocaust? And lastly, because uh, some of you are here getting continuing legal education credit for elimination of bias in the profession, I'm asking, uh, did it matter what the personal identity of the social justice lawyers was in these Holocaust uh, cases, and does it matter more generally? Put differently, for example, should we be biased in favor of Jewish lawyers as litigators on behalf of Jewish causes, like Holocaust litigation? Uh, for those of you who are taking MCLE credit, I'll go into law professor mode and ask you to think about that and come up with your own answer, and then I'll give you mine uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, so the first cluster of questions. Why did we file this litigation 50 years after the Holocaust? Uh, in 1995, 
the Clinton administration declassified World War II era documents that were located and housed in the US National Archives but were not available to the general public. Researchers went into those archives and they found uh, various documents of interest to historians, but in particular they found two categories of documents relating to the Swiss banks. Uh, one category uh, included documents showing uh, that the Swiss banks were the primary bankers for the Nazi regime. And in particular, that uh, the Nazis had looted gold in the countries they occupied, primarily from the central banks of those countries, but also directly from victims, primarily Jews, including uh, jewelry and gold uh, fillings from teeth. All that gold was smelted down, stamped with the Reichsbank mark, and laundered through the Swiss banks for cash because the Germans desperately needed cash to fund the Nazi war effort. And as a result of serving in this capacity, Switzerland as a country and the Swiss National Bank and Swiss private banks in particular extended the Nazi war effort by years. And by extending the Nazi war effort, they extended the implementation of the final solution by years. The second category of documents that we found in the archives were documents suggesting the existence of dormant accounts that the Swiss bank self-audits in prior years had not revealed. Once that information came to light, uh, various Holocaust victim advocates uh, began uh, militating to bring attention to this issue and to try to resolve this issue. The World Jewish Congress started negotiating with the Swiss Banking Association, the trade association for the Swiss banks. Uh, uh, Senator Al D'Amato, the head then of the Senate Banking Committee, held hearings that gained quite a bit of press attention. And as a result of that media coverage, heirs of Holocaust victims who had not been able to obtain account information over the years but who had never considered litigation started reaching out to lawyers across the country and reached out to class action lawyers uh, who had the competency and capacity to bring this kind of litigation against the Swiss banks. And as a result of that, uh, three different teams of lawyers from across the country independently filed cases in the Eastern District of New York against the three largest Swiss banks, UBS, Swiss Bank Corporation, which has since merged into UBS, and Credit Suisse. Uh, and these cases were assigned to Judge Edward Corman in the Eastern District of New York, and the litigation began. I became involved because when my firm was invited to co-counsel on these cases, my partners gave me the opportunity as a young uh, lawyer at the time, I was only 29 years old, uh, five years out of law school, to take the lead for the firm in this category of litigation. Uh, and I was uh, definitely part of a team. Within my firm, I was supported by my partners, uh, both in terms of advice and financially supported in terms of the costs of the litigation. And I had a team of associates working for me, then junior lawyers, now seasoned professionals, Lisa Lee of Karen Becker, Karen Mandel, just to name a few. And my firm was one of 10 firms in the Swiss Bank's case that uh, managed the litigation. Uh, and we were appointed by the court to do that. And uh, other team members included Bert Newborn, a professor of NYU, who was a former director of the ACLU, Mel Weiss from Milberg Weiss, Mike Hausfeld from the firm that was then Cohen, Milstein, Hausfeld, and Toll, Bob Swift from Cohn, Swift, and Graf. I rattle off these names so you realize this was a team effort with quite a few lawyers from across the country who took on the Swiss banks, a huge piece of litigation. On the other side uh, were uh, uh, lawyers from very large defense firms, uh, and we were definitely equally matched in the litigation. So we filed our complaints starting in 1996, and the banks quickly filed motions to dismiss. Uh, the motions to get rid of our cases and claims uh, raised some serious weaknesses in the cases that we had filed. I'll just mention two uh, that probably the lawyers in the room can already guess, uh, at least one of them, uh, just from hearing the narrative so far. One of the bases on which the Swiss tried to knock out our claims was that the statute of limitations had allegedly run. So anyone with a claim, a legal claim of any kind, by law has a period of a set number of years within which to bring the claim, uh, either measured from the date of injury or the date the claim was discovered 
discovered. And it is rare to see a case that's filed 50 years after some harm has occurred survive a motion to dismiss on the statute of limitations defense. It has happened, it actually did happen in one of our uh, French banks Holocaust cases, but at the time that we were litigating the Swiss banks case, it was a key weakness for us. In addition, the Swiss banks, through their counsel, filed a motion to dismiss on political question grounds. Uh, there's a doctrine called the political question doctrine which holds that uh, if a subject is better handled by a coordinate branch of government, say the executive branch, the court should abstain from uh, intervening. And in our case, the executive branch over the years had done quite a bit of work on behalf of Holocaust victims through country to country negotiations and the bank's motion to dismiss on that ground was one that presented a real threat to our claims and in fact resulted in dismissal of Holocaust era cases that we filed against German companies in New Jersey federal court. So how did we get from a motion to dismiss that raised some very serious threats to our litigation to a $1.25 billion settlement within a few years? Uh, I'll give you four key reasons, and I'm going to uh, give you a list of reasons um, that also gives me an opportunity to highlight certain facets of the litigation that I think are interesting and helpful uh, in terms of understanding the significance of these cases. First. Uh, the bank's defenses were mostly technical defenses, right? Whether the statute of limitation has run is a question of the timeliness of the filing of the claims. Whether the political question doctrine should be invoked is really a question of who should resolve the matter, who should be deciding uh, what the right thing to do is in light of the wrongs that are described in a complaint. They don't go to the merits. On the merits, we felt we had very strong claims. On the merits, we thought we could prove that the Swiss banks aided and abetted genocide in violation of international law by extending the Nazi war effort when it, uh, the banks laundered Nazi gold. And on the merits, we thought we had a very good chance of demonstrating that the banks mishandled client funds in breach of their fiduciary duties to Jewish and other uh, depositors who were targets of Nazi persecution. Uh, so if we could survive these technical defenses, we would be in front of a jury in Brooklyn uh, arguing the merits of these cases, and we thought we had a very good uh, shot there. So that added tremendous value to these claims. Uh, second, we had a wonderful judge. Uh, judge Corman is a fantastic jurist and uh, a brilliant jurist, and also uh, very accomplished at getting parties to settle. He did two things in particular in our case that helped uh, settlement uh, uh, move forward. One thing is he took his time on motions to dismiss. And whether he did this intentionally or not, he created a space in which the parties could negotiate settlement. Without that, uh, we would have had a difficult time because there were so many complex issues that had to be negotiated. And second, when the settlement negotiations looked like they were falling apart, uh, towards the end, there was a billion dollar gap between the parties. The Swiss bank said they would not pay a penny more than $450 million. And we, the plaintiff's lawyers, after consulting with other victims' advocates, including Holocaust survivor groups, insisted that we would not accept a penny less than $1.5 billion, given the nature of these claims and the bank's conduct. The judge brought us together over dinner at Gage and Tolner, a restaurant in New York, and had the parties talk late into the night until we finally reached a settlement at $1.25 billion. Another reason we were able to settle a case uh, despite uh, strong defenses that the defendants had in their arsenal was that uh, in a move I'm uh, sure the banks later came to regret. The banks agreed with the World Jewish Congress in 1995 to do an independent audit supervised by a committee they set up called the Volcker Commission that was headed by Paul Volcker, the former head of the Federal Reserve. And uh, under that uh, Volcker Commission's stewardship, the primary accounting firms in the United States and the world went into the Swiss bank's files and conducted the most comprehensive and expensive audit in history, in the history of accounting. It would cost $200 million just to pay for the auditors, not for the Swiss bank's time. And it revealed some facts that I want to share with you. Uh, the auditors found that 6.9 million accounts were open or opened in Swiss banks during the relevant time period, 1933 to 1945. Of these, documents relating to about 2.7 million accounts were completely destroyed. There was absolutely no record, not even the name of the account holder. 
Records relating to 4.1 million accounts did still exist, but for most of those it was a registry card and the card would just give the account holder's name, the date the account was opened, and if the account was closed, the date it was closed. But there might be no other information in a typical uh, account file. Uh, so what the auditors did was they matched the 4.1 million account holders' names against the list of names from Yad Vashem and elsewhere of persons who perished in the Holocaust, and they came up with a list of persons as to whom there may be accounts uh, still in the bank's files. Uh, they did additionally some hand audits for accounts that looked suspicious. And as a result of this search, uh, they came up with some numbers that were very different from the numbers revealed in the bank's self-audits. So remember I told you that the banks, as a result of all their voluntary audits, came up with about 1,500 to 2,000 accounts worth a few tens of millions of dollars. As a result of the Volcker audit, and even though there was widespread destruction of records, we found 36,000 accounts that had characteristics suggesting a connection to a victim or target of Nazi persecution. And the Volcker Commission and its auditors valued those accounts at somewhere between $643 million and $1.36 billion. A final reason we were able to settle this litigation is that luck was on our side. Uh, a key feature of our complaints was the allegation that the banks were systematically destroying Holocaust era records that would allow us to identify account holders uh, and link those accounts to their rightful owners. Uh, a security guard at UBS in 1997, after we had filed our complaints, accidentally walked into the shredding room and looked at the files that were in line to be shredded and found Holocaust era documents. He pulled some of those and he took them to the police in Switzerland and reported his employer. He was a whistleblower. The matter was referred to a Swiss prosecutor and the prosecutor decided not to charge the banks because that was at that point in time a violation of Swiss policy. Instead, the prosecutor threatened to criminally prosecute this security guard, not Jewish, just a person doing the right thing, with violating bank secrecy law. And in addition, uh, the Swiss media got a hold of this and Christoph Miley and his young family experienced death threats. So he and his family fled to the United States and I'm happy to report they are the first Swiss nationals ever to be granted asylum in the United States. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the media in the United States also got a hold of this and it further damaged the credibility of the Swiss banks, uh, helping to produce a settlement shortly thereafter. So the settlement terms were that the Swiss agreed to pay $1.25 billion. I'm watching the time, so I make sure there's time uh, for Q&A. The uh, Swiss banks uh, agreed to pay $1.25 billion. The settlement asked the plaintiffs and the class members, the persons who were similarly situated to our plaintiffs and who would benefit from the settlement, to release all their legal claims against the Swiss banks in exchange for that payment, which they did. They had an opportunity to opt out if they didn't want to participate, but very few did. And allocation decisions were left to the court. So Judge Corman appointed Judah Gribitz as a special master to uh, take input from all the class members and from the community regarding how the fund should be allocated and Judah Gribitz ably performed that function with assistance from his deputy special master Sherry Rieg and others and in the end proposed a plan of allocation that as to the dormant account claims that were the heart of the case and the focus of my presentation involved a, an evidence-based claims program. Uh, there, we could have done a non-evidence-based claims program. We could have just equitably allocated the funds among all persons who met some threshold determination. But instead, we wanted to use a compensatory damages model, not a reparations model. And I can talk about the difference in Q&A if there's an interest. But we wanted to match uh, the strength of the claims with the amount of the payment in order, uh, in part, to be fair to those persons who are relinquishing legal claims, but also to rebut claims that this litigation was just blackmail and that it wasn't based on evidence, uh, claims that had been made by the Swiss banks and their supporters. Uh, so we used evidence to match claimants with dollar amounts in the claims program using also presumptions. So for example, since the Swiss had destroyed so many documents, if we knew that an account had been opened in the relevant time period, 33 to 45, and based on the bank's records had been closed, but we couldn't tell who took the funds from that account, whether they went to the account holder or to the Reichsbank. 
The presumption was an adverse inference because the banks had spoliated the evidence that the money had gone to the Reich Bank, that the Swiss banks had improperly transferred funds in breach of their fiduciary duties to the claimants. And there's actually a doctrine in US law that allows these kinds of adverse inferences when a defendant has destroyed evidence necessary to determine liability. Uh, and similarly, if the banks had destroyed the evidence indicating the value of the account at the time of closure, we used presumptive average values. So we knew for any particular account type what the average value of that account was as of 1945 and could make an award on that basis. So how did the Froelich family fare in our claims program? Uh, 50 years after uh, Herman Froelich wrote his May 14, 1948 letter to a Swiss bank, and several decades after Herman Froelich's death, his sons, Peter and Gerald Froelich, filed a claim in our litigation. So we used the Volcker audit results and other sources to process that claim, and we found copies of the May 14 letter from Herman Froelich, which he had long since lost, copies of the May 26 response from the bank, which Herman Froelich had long since lost and was no longer with his family, uh, and we found two accounts, one from Lena Froelich and one opened by Manfred Froelich, Herman's uh, Froelich's parents. The bank records indicated that the account for Lena Froelich had a presumed average value of 47,400 Swiss francs, and the account of Manfred Froelich had a presumed average value of 162,500 Swiss francs. Uh, and the reason uh, Peter and Gerald Froelich knew to make a claim was because uh, he saw his grandparents' names in a published list of names, so was able to uh, make a claim that would otherwise, through bank secrecy laws, uh, have been impossible. As of March 2013, this claims program took a long time to implement. The claims process associated with the settlement resulted in the payment of more than 17,000 dormant account claims, with average payments for documented claims of in excess of $150,000. So with that in mind, understanding what the litigation was about and how we achieved this settlement, I'll turn to the second cluster of questions that I promised I would consider with you, which is, did our litigation provide meaningful justice to Holocaust victims? Was litigation an appropriate response to the Holocaust? There were uh, several very serious criticisms that were leveled against uh, the lawyers and the plaintiffs who pursued this litigation. I do not have time in this lecture to cover all of them, but I did want to address what I thought was the most powerful and the one that certainly received probably the most press attention. That was, that suing for money dishonored the memory of those who perished during the Holocaust and made Jews look like they were just out for the money since Jews were primarily the plaintiffs in the Swiss Bank's case. That was the uh, criticism. And I respect that criticism and I respect the persons who made it. It was made by uh, Holocaust victim advocates including Abe Foxman who was then uh, associated with the American Anti-Defamation League. So. Uh, this was a, 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 a difficult criticism that was leveled, but it was one that was met by a response, not just by the lawyers, but by other victim advocates, for example. Ellie Wiesel, hearing this criticism, responded that we should not be editing our stories uh, in response to fears of anti-Semitism, that we should just tell our truth. And if our truth in, in includes uh, property claims as a result of the Holocaust, then those stories need to be told. And uh, other victim advocates similarly rejected the criticism, including the WJRO, the World Jewish Restitution Organization, which was devoted institutionally to helping uh, Jews in particular uh, recover assets that had been Aryanized or otherwise uh, stolen by Nazi Germany and by private entities that were collaborating with Nazi Germany. Uh, I too obviously disagreed with the criticism. Uh, however we characterize the Holocaust, uh, property has to be a big part of that narrative. Uh, the Nazis murdered six million Jews. They destroyed European Jewish communities and culture. And they also, in connection with that, committed one of the greatest thefts in history. They took billions of dollars in Jewish assets 
systematically and intentionally to fund the Nazi war effort. That was a part of the final solution and was an impetus for the final solution in addition to anti-Semitism. Uh, my view is that highlighting the Swiss bank's role in that theft does not dishonor the victims of Nazi persecution. It dishonors the banks. The world now knows that Swiss neutrality serving as the bankers for the Nazi regime was immoral. And the world now knows that Swiss bank secrecy, which through the years had been used uh, as a principle, as a moral commitment, and as a business uh, commitment by the Swiss banks, uh, was also an opportunity by those same banks uh, motivated by profit to exploit Holocaust victims and their heirs. Uh, you get a little sense of the impact that this has uh, truth-telling that our litigation served has had uh, when you see recent press coverage uh, describing the Department of Justice's criminal complaints against various Swiss banks for using bank secrecy to help United States citizens avoid paying taxes. In response to those criminal charges, the banks waived the shield of bank secrecy, and that shield simply does not have the legal or moral weight that it had before we brought the Holocaust era cases. Uh, so I'm uh, actually proud of that accomplishment. Did the Holocaust era litigation provide meaningful justice to Holocaust victims? It was justice delayed in that uh, it was justice 50 years after the fact. Uh, many of the people on whose behalf we could have sued perished during the Holocaust, uh, and their heirs had died by the time we brought these claims. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, evidence was lost, uh, memories faded. Uh, so in that regard, it was justice, but justice delayed. And uh, for those persons who had legitimate claims, but at least as to dormant accounts, for whom we could not find any documentary evidence, it was definitely an imperfect justice because we were unable to compensate those persons given the structure of the claims program. But for thousands of persons like Peter and Gerald Froelich, our litigation and the, our settlement provided real meaningful justice. And for all claimants, we provided an opportunity to make a claim, for that claim to be heard sympathetically, uh, for the uh, evidence connected to that claim to be marshaled, and for payments to be made on those claims that matched the strength of the evidence. And uh, for a uh, uh, United States lawyer uh, committed to procedural due process, that is a form of justice. Uh, of course, uh, it is uh, not complete justice, uh, but it is a form of justice. So, uh, I'm switching to the third and last of my clusters of questions, but I've been asked to ask those of you who wrote down questions, and I encourage you to do so if you have any, to pass those to the aisle and to pass them to the same aisle. So if you could pass them all to your left. Whatever your left is, you can pass your uh, cards to the left, and uh, those cards will be collected. Uh, the last topic that I'm addressing is, does personal identity affect the quality of social cause lawyering? For example, is a Jewish lawyer a better advocate for Holocaust victims than a non-Jewish lawyer? Uh, should we be biased in favor of having persons who are members of the victims' groups on whose behalf they're litigating uh, be counsel for those groups? I'll venture a conceptual answer, a doctrinal answer, and then an answer from personal experience. Conceptually, the answer to this question depends in large part on what it means to be a Jewish lawyer. For those receiving CLE credit, there are some materials uh, on the side of the room, including a reader that has two articles in it, uh, one by Professor Sanford Levinson and the other by Professor Russell Pierce, both of whom uh, developed models of the Jewish lawyer that I'll describe for you. Uh, one model is the lawyer who happens to be Jewish say Jewish by birth, but who has uh, not been raised in a household that emphasized Judaism either as a culture or as a religion, uh, didn't uh, have any sense of a communal identification with other Jews, and considers his Jewishness to be no more uh, relevant to determining his characteristics as a person or his identity than his hair color or his eye color. Uh, a second model they posited was the ethnic Jew. 
the Jew who identifies with Jewish communities and Jewish culture and causes sees himself as a member of a group but does not necessarily see himself as bound by Jewish texts or law. A third model they posited was an ethnic Jew who not only sees himself as connected to the Jewish community, but sees that Jewish community as tied together by a shared experience of having been persecuted over the centuries, and thus identifies not only with other Jews, but culturally uh, with other persecuted minorities. Uh, and then a final model they posited was the Jew who is a religious Jew, an observant Jew, who uh, follows Jewish texts and Jewish law. Uh, there are two additional conceptual variables I'll put on the table to help us answer this question, uh, should we be biased in favor of Jewish lawyers when it comes to Jewish causes, or more generally, lawyers who are members of the victim groups they seek to represent. One is that in addition to the models that professors Levinson and Pierce developed, I would add uh, addition, an additional variable. It matters uh, whether the particular lawyer's identification is intense or not. The level of intensity makes a difference. So you can have someone who is, for example, an ethnically identified Jew, but is weakly ethnically identified, uh, identifies with Jewish culture or communities, but is mostly assimilated. That person might react to uh, Jewish causes or uh, issues that come up in the context of lawyering differently than, say, someone who is strongly ethnically identified as Jewish. And then the last variable I would put on the table conceptually is the inferences a lawyer draws from his or her Jewish identity will vary by lawyer. So, for example, take the ethnic Jewish lawyer whose identification is not only with the Jewish community but with other persecuted groups, that person may draw as an inference from his Jewish identity that it is important to be committed to the rule of law. That rule of law, that commitment to principles and equality ultimately is in the best interests of persecuted minorities, including uh, Jews. So with that kind of inference drawn from identity, you wouldn't be surprised to see a Jewish lawyer, for example, working for the ACLU on First Amendment grounds defending a neo-Nazi's right to protest or to otherwise express himself. Uh, and we should also not be too terribly surprised, given that possible inference from one's Jewish identity, to learn that the key lead defense counsel for the Swiss banks in the Holocaust cases was a Jew. Roger Witten, from a law firm uh, then called Wilmer Cutler, now called Wilmer Hale. Uh, and uh, I am sure if you asked him, he would also uh, say that uh, his commitment to the rule of law led him to uh, defend the banks vigorously uh, because every defendant is entitled to adequate and competent counsel. A different Jewish lawyer might also be in this group, one whose uh, Jewish identity is primarily an ethnic one, but might draw a completely different inference under the circumstances, uh, and might say uh, that that lawyer's communal identification with other Jews transcends commitment to rule of law and principles. That particular Jewish lawyer might, as a result of being Jewish, say, refuse to defend uh, private corporations that are accused of aiding and abetting genocide or otherwise profiting from Nazi atrocities. And we saw both types of Jewish identity being expressed in the Holocaust cases. So, using the Jewish lawyer as an example, the conceptual answer to the question, does a cause lawyer, a social justice lawyer's identity affect the, qualowing, the quality of his lawyering? The answer is a contingent one. It depends on what kind of Jewish lawyer we have and how that lawyer experiences his or her Jewish identity. Doctrinally, as a matter of the law governing lawyers, personal identity should not affect the quality of our lawyering. 
all lawyers are bound by the same law governing lawyers, which imposes duties on us grounded in agency law and fiduciary law, and the core duty for every lawyer is a duty of loyalty to the client, which includes the duty of zealous advocacy, zealous advocacy, regardless of the client's identity or the cause at issue. Uh, some commentators, including uh, Stanford law professor Norm Spaulding, suggest that too much identification with our clients actually produces relatively worse lawyering than a weak identification with clients because a hallmark of a good lawyer is a certain critical distance necessary to exercise independent judgment on behalf of the client. And if we're too strongly identified with our clients, according to Professor Spaulding, uh, we may not be able to provide that essential service of independent judgment grounded in critical distance. So, uh, doctrinally, as a matter of the law governing lawyers, conceptually, uh, as a matter of uh, thinking through what Jewish identity means, I think the answer to the question, should we be biased in favor of Jewish lawyers prosecuting Jewish causes, is clearly no. And I'll just add a personal note, which is, uh, I litigated other human rights claims subsequent to the Holocaust cases. For example, I prosecuted cases on behalf of comfort women who were uh, enslaved, kidnapped first, and then enslaved by the Japanese military during World War II, kept in uh, horrible conditions, and uh, never had the opportunity to sue to recover for the personal injuries they suffered as a result of that experience. I litigated as aggressively and passionately on behalf of those clients as I did on behalf of my Jewish clients. And uh, it was possibly due to the fact that if I had to pick a model, I'm one of the ethnically identified Jews who identifies with other persecuted minorities, but I like to think it was because of my commitment to the rule of law and in particular to the law governing lawyers that I zealously advocated on behalf of my non-Jewish clients. And I would like to think that it's a good thing that uh, we do not select or express bias in favor of lawyers just because of their personal identification or group membership. I will also add, however, uh, though I provided the same quality of service emotionally, uh, litigating the Holocaust cases was very different from litigating any other type of claim. Uh, I care about all of my clients, and as a law professor, I care about all of my students. But to litigate this one issue, uh, I, I felt not only the connection to the uh, persons I represented, but I knew to my bones that but for uh, the mistake of history, or I should say the lucky happy stance for me of history, I could easily have been any one of my clients. Uh, I didn't feel any distance whatsoever in terms of the struggles they faced and uh, the harms they suffered. So I'm about to switch from a lecture format to a Q&A format, but I wanted to make a few concluding remarks. We are approaching Yom HaShoah. Holocaust Remembrance Day on April 27th, which marks, among other things, the 71st anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Litigation is really nothing like a ghetto uprising, except in this regard. The essential feature of litigation is a kind of defiance and rebelliousness. A plaintiff commences a lawsuit because she has experienced some injustice, and she is unwilling to tolerate it and she hires lawyers on her behalf to right that wrong in an act of defiance, using the law, but in an act of defiance. To the millennials in this audience, to the extent there are any, uh, the college students or those of you who are in law school who are thinking what to do with your lives, I have this advice. If you are defiant, if you are rebellious, you may have a career ahead of you in social justice lawyering. Those are... <laughs> Those are qualities you can harness for the greater good. Thank you for letting me share with you tonight, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We have a number of questions this evening. Um, 
too many to ask all of them, uh, but we'll try to get to a few. Um, the, the first harkens back to the fundamental philosophical question that Morris posed at the outset. The question is, what, if any, was the compensation for the loss of life in the Holocaust? Uh, and if so, how has this amount arrived at? Great. Uh, thank you. So that's a wonderful question. So I should clarify. We uh, did not sue to address the Holocaust. We sued private corporations that either aided and abetted the Nazis or, as in the case of the Swiss banks, independently engaged in conduct that allowed them to profit from Nazi atrocities. So the claims were mostly um, uh, targeted to the type of misconduct at issue, private corporate misconduct. For banks, the primary measure of the compensation was the value of a bank account. For insurance policies, unpaid life insurance policies, the primary measure of the compensation would be the value of the policy, the unpaid policy, mixed with some sort of metric regarding the quality of the proof connected to that claim. However, we did sue most uh, German uh, manufacturers, uh, from BMW to Siemens, we had uh, 60 cases on file throughout the federal court system by the time we settled these cases. We sued them for their slave and forced labor program. And um, that program with regards to Jews was the slave labor program. It was a work to death program. So uh, most of the people who were forced to work as slave laborers died. Our clients were the few who managed to survive, mostly children at the time of the Holocaust. And their claims were related to their treatment as slave laborers. And in that sense, it became uh, something closest to what the question describes. How do you measure that kind of suffering, that kind of pain and suffering? Uh, and the answer is you don't. There is no way to do that. There are, there are ways to do that for personal injuries in the United States courts. There was no way to do that in connection with uh, payments to Holocaust survivors when we had capped settlements. So we had, for example, a $5 billion settlement with German manufacturers for the slave and forced labor claims. But there was no way to come anywhere close to uh, compensation amounts that bore any serious relationship to the kind of pain and suffering those persons endured. Instead, they became, we used there a reparations model of payment. It became a symbolic payment to each person as a form of very imperfect justice, simply to acknowledge the wrongdoing of these manufacturers. But there was no real relationship uh, in that regard between the uh, actual suffering on an individual by individual basis and the compensation. So following up on the corporate issues, uh, the next question concerns um, Jewish and other Holocaust survivor or Holocaust victim accounts uh, taken by the Nazis. And then it goes on to ask, were any American companies guilty of profiting from slave labor in Germany? Such yes. as American companies like General Motors or Ford that might have had plants or IBM that might have had business relations. Yes. So we sued IBM, we sued Ford, we sued American companies that had uh, German subsidiaries where the German subsidiaries used uh, slave labor. Uh, so our, actually our first of the slave labor cases was against uh, Ford Motor Company, a uh, Holocaust survivor who had been in a concentration camp and forced to perform slave labor for a Ford subsidiary uh, in Nazi uh, Germany. Uh, was our primary lead plaintiff. The New Jersey uh, federal court dismissed that case on political question grounds, but that uh, plaintiff was nevertheless able to partake in the uh, 10 billion Deutschmark, 5 billion US dollar settlement that we negotiated with the German economy uh, as a claimant. I'm gonna merge two questions here. Uh, one questioner had asked uh, about the similar topic of what compensation should there be for the Russian pogroms. And another questioner asks, do you think there should be a statute of limitations on claims like this? Would you still litigate a case like this in 100 years? 
Um, I merged the two since obviously at this time in this set of political affairs there's not much we can do about wrongs in Russia. But if one looks forward many years at some point in the t future, the question might be on point and then it ties back into statute of limitations questions. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, I guess uh, I'll start by saying that um, the statute of limitations, I'll deal with that first, is normally set by uh, statute, sometimes developed by common law. And so Congress could, for example, pass a law saying that um, historical claims of any variety, including Holocaust era claims or claims of persons uh, against uh, uh, entities involved in Russian programs have a 75-year statute of limitations. They could just pass that law. Um, so uh, it's a matter of political will in, in uh, uh, some uh, ways, but uh, Congress has uh, not on balance been in favor of expanding litigants' rights. Uh, for a very long time now, for the past several decades, we've been in a period of uh, contraction of litigants' rights. And that relates to the second part of the question. So when we sued uh, Swiss banks and other private corporations, we sued on behalf of both American citizens, but also primarily on behalf of foreign nationals who had claims against these companies. And for the foreign nationals, we were suing on behalf of foreigners, foreign corporations, for conduct that took place abroad it had very little connection to the United States or U.S. courts. The way we were able to do that is that back in 1996, uh, the Alien Tort Claim Statute, a statute passed uh, by the first Congress that allows a foreign national to sue for torts in violation of the law of nations, had been given up until that point a uh, robust interpretation. It was available as a jurisdictional hook so that foreign nationals could sue for basic international human rights violations in U.S. court. The idea being that our courts should be available to anyone, anywhere to protect fundamental human rights. Uh, that opportunity has been severely contracted as a result of recent Supreme Court decisions under uh, the more conservative Supreme Court that we now have. So for example, in approximately 2006, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision called SOSA. Uh, which decided uh, to narrow the types of claims that would be deemed claims uh, that could be prosecuted under the Alien Tort Claims Act, a very narrow definition of uh, fundamental international human rights law. And more recently, uh, the Supreme Court entertained in a case called Kiobel uh, v. Shell, uh, the question of whether uh, foreign corporations are even covered by international law, fundamental human rights international law, uh, and instead decided a different issue, which was just as bad for us, which is that um, if a case involves foreign nationals suing a foreign entity for misconduct, including international human rights violations that occurred abroad, United States courts shouldn't have jurisdiction to hear those claims. So there's been a dramatic contraction of those claims. And unless something changes politically or in our court system, I do not see, for example, someone being able to come into United States court and sue for something that happened in Russia, uh, uh, something that has little connection to the United States. The next question is also a double barrel question. I think you may have answered the first part. First part is, did, did Judge Corman ever rule on all or any part of the motion to dismiss issues? And the second related question is, uh, assuming that you proceeded to trial and obtained a judgment, how did you intend to enforce the judgment? Oh, those are great questions. So Judge Corman never ruled on the motions to dismiss. We settled those cases before he ruled. Um, he did issue a decision in 2004. So we, we had this settlement, which obviated the need to decide the motions to dismiss. But then after uh, 
we had already settled the case. The bank's liability was capped at $1.25 billion. They had no more interest in the litigation. It was now just a matter of implementing the settlement and uh, the claims programs uh, under the settlement. The banks kept filing papers objecting to uh, things like our presumptions, saying that we shouldn't presume uh, that the banks systematically destroyed records. And in 2004, in response to these repeated objections, the judge issued a decision characterizing them as frivolous and sort of uh, suggesting that some portion of our case would probably have survived a motion to dismiss. He went through uh, allegation by allegation of our complaint and basically found as a matter of fact that what we had alleged was true uh, for the most part with regards to the core allegations on the merits. Uh, as to the statute of limitations I mentioned, our judge didn't rule on that, but another judge, Judge uh, Sam Johnson in uh, the Southern District of New York, in a case we brought against French banks for retaining dormant accounts, did rule that the claims were timely. Uh, and uh, in terms of how we would have enforced a judgment, Thankfully, we were suing Swiss banks. So this is a terribly difficult issue when uh, human rights activists sue a defendant who has limited assets in the United States. For example, one of my colleagues in the Swiss banks litigation, Bob Swift from Cohn, Swift & Graf, was the lead uh, counsel in a human rights class action against the estate of Ferdinand Marcos on behalf of a thousand persons who had been tortured by the Marcos regime. and. Uh, they sued in federal court in Hawaii, I think, and got a billion dollar judgment, and then spent the next 20 years trying to collect that judgment with very little success. Uh, but we sued uh, United Bank of Switzerland, UBS, and Credit Suisse, and they have uh, very many assets in the United States. I have little doubt that we would have been able to enforce a judgment here given the extent to which those banks are uh, interconnected with the United States economy. Regarding those settlements, have all the funds and claims been processed, and were there any leftover funds? And if so, what was done with those funds? Great. So uh, the first of the settlements that we negotiated with the Swiss banks was the last one to complete the allocation program for reasons I can explain. Uh, and that settlement is largely uh, implemented. There are a few appeals that are still pending, and there is a uh, $50 million remainder, I think, and the court is now considering what to do with that remainder. Um, it could be used either to bump up payments to those who already were paid on dormant account claims, or the judge has, uh, for a different class, not the dormant accounts class in that settlement, but for the looted asset class, uh, uh, approved a claims program that's a, what we call a Cypre program that delivers food, uh, medical care, and other services to Holocaust survivors worldwide in lieu of direct payments because it's impossible to connect a looted asset claim to a particular dollar amount for most plaintiffs in the Swiss case. So any remainder could easily be used for that purpose as well. Uh, all of the other settlements have been fully implemented as far as I know. and. Uh, there has been no remainder. The amounts have been uh, fully provided to uh, the plaintiffs and the class members. This last question, I think, is a good wrap up for the ethics aspect of this talk. Was there any one particular event that triggered your passion for justice in these cases, notwithstanding the very substantial obstacles? That's a good question. So I don't know that there was any one event, but I'll tell you, uh, we labored from 1996 uh, when we first filed these cases with contact uh, with our clients and a few people in the community, but not uh, with the opportunity to talk to large groups of people until we settled the first of the cases, the Swiss Banks case in uh, uh, well, it was settled in principle in 1998, but we didn't have the final settlement approved until 2000. And in connection with that, Judge Corman held hearings in Brooklyn and then additional hearings elsewhere in the world to give uh, persons who were class members an opportunity to come forward and provide comment on the settlement. Uh, they could have objected or they could have uh, just uh, said whatever they wanted to say about either the overall settlement amount or the claims programs. And in connection with those hearings, we did a worldwide notice program and got uh, 
an opportunity to hear from claimants who could either submit an opt-out request or a request to participate in the settlement. And in connection with both of those things, the live hearings and the written response from the class members, I for the first time got a sense of the scale of what we were doing. Uh, at the hearings, uh, dozens of class members whom I had never met came forward, Holocaust survivors or the heirs of Holocaust victims and told personal stories which uh, were quite moving. And in connection with the written notice program, we received in excess of 500,000 written questionnaires from uh, Holocaust survivors or the heirs of Holocaust victims containing their stories in writing, uh, usually in very hard to read handwriting, uh, sometimes 20, 30 pages of stories about what happened to them, uh, sometimes linked to the Swiss Bank's case, but sometimes just said in free-flowing form to describe that person's uh, connection to the Holocaust and experiences during the Holocaust. And really at that point it came home that uh, I as a single lawyer working on a team, but you know as a relatively young lawyer, had a chance just by pursuing social cause litigation to participate in something so much bigger than myself. Uh, it was a sort of defining moment for me in the litigation uh, in terms of who we were as victim advocates and what we accomplished with that litigation and what we can accomplish with respect to other social injustices we hope to address as uh, social cause lawyers or social justice advocates. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Well, I think Professor Ratner has shown us um, the best end of the legal profession and what can be achieved if you think big and have the perseverance to keep on going. Um, really hope that we can see you back here in the fall for the next installment in this lecture series. So again, thanks to Professor Ratner, thanks to Professor Weisberg for putting this together, thanks to UC Hastings. Thank you all.